Hey everyone, welcome back to the Primal Blueprint Podcast. Today, I have a really fun guest, fellow podcaster, Alex Terranova. He is a high performance coach and also works with just strong, successful leaders, innovators. Uh, We'll talk about his journey to this position. Um, I also had the pleasure of being interviewed by him as well, talking about confidence. That's a really fun episode as well. Um, I won't read off your whole bio. We're going to get into it, but welcome to the show, Alex. Hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Glad to have you here. I love, always love these conversations that have to do with improving one's life, up-leveling, income, all that kind of stuff. But let's just talk about, you had become quite high up in a whole restaurant situation. So you were in (laughs) sort of the corporate world here for a bit. Tell us, where'd you come from? How did you get here? Well, I came, it's a little known fact, but I came from my mother. Um, She birthed me. I don't know why she would have paired up with my father to do that, but she did. She made that choice and uh, I'm here now, so I'm super grateful. Um, But I, uh, I grew up in LA. I never knew what I wanted to do. I was like one of those kids who was like, it was all about sports. And for most people that are all about sports, you kind of find out at some point or another, you're probably not going to be a professional, um, or you're going to have to do some things. Maybe you're unwilling to do to get to that next level. And I think that's where I was like, I just wasn't good enough to keep, to keep going beyond high school. And I don't think I ever thought about what, what else, what else do you do with, you know, like, and I didn't have parents that like pressured me into like, you need to be a lawyer or a doctor. So, you know, they kind of screwed me over in that sense. (laughs) Um, but I found myself in college, not knowing what to do. And I found myself in the restaurant industry, bartending, waiting tables, and my temperament was awesome for it. Super even keel, you know, like able to train people and ha- and and really serve customers while not like getting all frazzled or whatever. The restaurant industry is a complete shit show. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's mostly people who don't who didn't choose to be there. You know, they 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 want to do other things. Right. Um, and I actually fell in love with it. I thought it was, I had a lot of fun. I loved the youthfulness of it. And next thing I knew I was like 25 and I'm like open in restaurants. And by the time I was 30, I had moved to New York to run a, a, like a, 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 a seven figure restaurant group that by the, about two years later, when I left, we had doubled the size of it. And I was the director of operations, did franchising manuals, all the training, like all the things. And I was miserable. I didn't even know. I didn't, I, I, it's you. So I can say fuck, right. I didn't know how fucking miserable I was. Um, but I was so it's weird. Like we don't know what happiness is until we like find it. And we don't know what miserable is until we see something else. Yep. And that way that I was like, I thought that's what life was like work, do, do a bunch of work, try to sleep with hot women, try to buy better cars, dr- you know, drink your feelings away, do drugs to feel different, eat good food. It was nothing wrong with any of those things. Right. But it was like, at the end of the day, I was like, wait, this is, this is it. And it all looked good on paper. I wasn't a mess. I wasn't, I didn't have mug shots or anything. Um, but I was like sad and unfulfilled and unhappy. And that was when I got asked, what I was grateful for by my cousin. And I didn't know how to answer the question. And I burst into tears because I think in a moment it was like, I got, I like to say like, God punched me right in the nose and was like, wake up. Um, But yeah, I realized like, wow, I have what 99% of the world would want, right? A good job, my health, my family, a whole bunch of possibility and opportunity. And I'm like, nope, I want a better car. I want a better place to live. And I kind of vowed in that moment, like, I got to do things differently because I'm only 32 at that point. And if I keep living like this, I'm going to become a bitter, grumpy old man, um, or I'm going to become like just a shitty person for lack of a better word. Like, (laughs) you know, I was headed in the wrong direction. (laughs) Yeah. Going one of the get off my lawn guys, like real quick. Um, So what what was it? Was uh, there a book? Was there a speaker? Was there some sort of mindset or something that you were turned on to that led you down the road to think about this? Because for example, that situation where you're like, I can't answer what I'm grateful for, but there's a lot of people who have a different mindset who would be able to access that. So clearly you weren't even in the sphere of this kind of thinking. So what road did you go on and what did you learn that made you go, hold on a minute, I can actually create my reality. I can kind of change with intention and I can use my thoughts in different ways than I've been using them. What, what did that for you? I realized how conditioned I was. 
right? Like I was so like, I watched all the NBA games like every night and there's a game on every night, right? Thank God it wasn't baseball or I wouldn't have been able to go to work. Um, <laughs> you know, I was like, I went to USC. I was obsessed with college football. I would like leave important things to go watch football games. Um, and in that moment of like kind of waking up, I was like, what is, what is this life that I'm living? And I just started to like, kind of look at it with some questions. Why do I, why is, why am I more concerned with watching other people live out their dreams on TV than actually cultivating my own? Mm. And I started to think like, man, I spend a lot of time watching shows. Like maybe I should read some books or something. Um, I started to think like, what do other people do for a living besides like the five jobs that we all know, right? Um, so it started with just some questions. And then I went to my aunt and uncle who had been really successful in multi-level marketing. And just to be like, they seemed like a really happy couple. They travel all over. They seem to love what they do. And they invited me to like check out their business, which that's what people do, right? In multi-level marketing. And Ro I could, rope it in their family members. <laughs> totally. Right. And and I and and look, they they are they're very, they've been doing this for 30 years. They're they're not like a fly by the seat of their pants sure. kind of it's a real career and, a, and a, it's created a great life for, for my family, for that side of my family. So I, I went in, I trusted. And what I saw right away was personal development, which I'd never seen. I like, I mean, I think we like see Tony Robbins, right? We like see these people. It's like, what does this mean? It's some guy yelling at us, telling us we can be better. I like really saw it from the inside of like being inquisitive and asking questions and trying to practicing and that while I didn't, well, multi-level marketing wasn't for me, what I really loved about that world was they're very all about like improving yourself and growing yourself. And you can only go as far as you're willing to take yourself. And so that invited me into, I need to start doing things that I don't normally do or things that I'm uncomfortable doing, right? Like I got to get, I got to like, not just go to the gym because the gym is a safe, comfortable place. Maybe I should try to go to yoga. Maybe I should eat different foods and see how I feel. Maybe I should hang out with not at a bar every night, but like maybe I should go to like an improv class or um, I don't know, go to an art show or something like just yeah, things that because life becomes rote and mundane and mm -hmm. robotic and you're like, damn, it's the same thing over and over, over again and on over. rinse and repeat. Yeah. Yeah. And so we get the same things, right? And then we, it's like, we wonder, well, a lot of people I think wonder why their lives don't change. Well, you got to do something different. That that's where all these things like magically almost, I started meeting people that were calling themselves coaches and I hated them. They were too positive, too happy yeah. about yeah. their lives. Unreal, like unreal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, I, one of the things I loved when I met you is you were just like dropping F-bombs right and left. And I really like to pride myself on like, just because I work with, with corporate clients in a corporate world and do very professional work, I don't have to put myself in a monkey suit. I don't have to talk the way like this special, like we, people that wanna work with me want realness, they want rawness. I love to tell a client, hey, you're actually just being an asshole. Did you hear what you just told me? Um, and, yeah, and by the way, that that's the, and mm, this goes to our talk on your podcast with uh, about confidence. This is about authenticity reigns supreme. Your clients would rather have you be like, you know what, dude, you're being a dick. Cause they know in that moment they were, they need to hear themselves called on mm -hmm. it and humbles them. And they're going to respect you more. They appreciate you more yeah. for doing that thing that even though it's uncomfortable, no one wants to get called on their shiz. See what I'm saying though? Yeah. It's, it's a good yeah. nugget. Yeah. And, and like, that's what they're here for, right? Like if you want to live in a cave and not see anything but your own perspective, that's available for you. Right. We, that's right. kind of who I was pre, right. I, I was like, this is how restaurants work. If anyone like saw it different, it was like, they're wrong. It was very righteous. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and I love like, to me, if, if you're here, if you want to talk to a coach, if you're listening to this podcast, you have a, at least there's a crack in that armor that you want to be open to something new and different. And that's exciting, right? Like to be able to have someone go, Hey, this is scary. You're different or I'm uncomfortable, but yet like, I'm still here, like I'm showing up. And I think that's where I was, where I had got to the point where even though my life wasn't sucky or shitty, it wasn't working for me and the experience of it. And I got to this place where even though these coaches sounded like, you know, clowns, like, like with all this, like happy positivity stuff, I was like, man, the fact that this is uncomfortable, I need to look here. Like, why can't I be with people's joy? 
Um, <laughs> and that opened up a, a whole thing into like coach training and going through like a really in, uh, a year long, a $20,000 year long, 250 hours of like in-person coach training which if, I mean, pe people that know about the industry, that's not how most people get trained. No. Um, it's usually like, you know, $475 over a weekend and you're certified. Um, I got my ass. Okay, you know, let's just talk about this because yeah. there's people with PhDs that can't logicalize themselves out of the <laughs> bag. There are people who have, you know, law degrees, the most illogical people I've ever met, but they scored the highest on the LSAT. Yeah. Listen, you know, you can go get a training how good are you at the thing? Sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And oftentimes I think uh, I was talking about this the other day with um, Ashley Stahl, who uh, is a former counterterrorism expert who became a career coach because she realized mm -hmm. I don't want to work in the Pentagon and do this stuff. And she became a career coach and she's really good at it. And uh, we were just talking about how there's a lot of people who will, will gr grab onto a career. Like they'll be like, Oh, I want to do that. And then you see them in it and it's, it's a, it's a total disaster. It's a total mismatch. And they keep pushing through anyway, because that's what they declared themselves to be, or they want to be without taking that look and going, is this really for me? I've seen that a lot too. So, you know, I think again, we have these things like, Oh, I'd, I'd probably be good at that. Let me go do that. That's, is that your dream? That's not your dream. You know? Yeah. I we well that's that conditioning right like what that our, our communities our churches our parents our tv influences that like these are the things we're supposed to do or it's like we got to make money you know or we got to have a family whatever or we got to live in a certain place and i think that has a most of us aren't even aware of our conditioning the my book fictional authenticity was all about is it's it's all about how right i thought i was authentic but I wrote this fictional identity for Love myself. Thank you. When like, I, and I wrote it when I was a kid, right? I wrote it because Zach Morris on Saved by the Bell was like the cool guy who always got the girl. <laughs> and you know, the the I found out I was Italian in like my like in my family background, and it was like, well, all the mafia guys are so tough, and and I was scared when I was a little kid. So if I if I made myself tough like that, I would feel safe. But then you grow up and you're like, what is like, I don't want to be like Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell. He actually was an asshole and <laughs> manipulated everyone to get whatever he wanted. But the perception back then, right, was like, oh, look how much fun he's having. He gets the girl. He's successful. All these things. I think that when we when we look at like coaching or any career, right, like there's some careers you need to go get like a certification, like to be a lawyer, right? You got to pass the bar to be a doctor. You need to go to medical school. And those are probably good things. Um, and I think that we live in a world now where we where a, one of the coolest things we have is you can invent, you can say whatever it is you want to be. You don't want to be the gender you are. You can say you're a different gender. You don't want to have a gender at all. You can do that. You don't, you want to make up a title for your job. You want to make up a race for yourself. I think that's pretty cool that we live where like people can literally create their lives exactly the way that they want them. The consequence of that sometimes is when those things impact other people, right? If I say I'm a, I'm a horse, like who cares, right? It makes no difference. But if I say I'm a, you know, career coach and I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm like just out here, like throwing advice at people, it, there's some consequences. So for me, yeah, and that's was, the consequences of uh, no amount of confidence is going to override prepar preparation and knowledge. Do you know what yeah. I'm saying? So, uh, and then you're getting into a little bit of a con man game kind of, mm -hmm. because you are, and here's the thing, those, you, those uh, moments are usually found out, you know, you, it's, it's hard to keep up appearances sure. because you're not going to be delivering. Yeah. 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 And for me, that's, that was really important to me. Like I wasn't going to say I was, I needed to, I wanted to get some knowledge, right? Cause, and, uh, and understand that like, hey, my way of living my life is not the way that you should live your life or anyone else should live theirs. I think it's really important that we don't do that as coaches, as leaders, we don't condition other people to think our way is the right way. You know, your way of getting confidence and my way of getting confidence is a good way, but it's not the only way. And I think it's so important for people to be able to, for people like us to be able to ask the right questions that have them have these amazing answers that show up that go, oh, I never saw it that way. Or I never thought about it like this. I should try this. And it's, and it's so much more powerful than me saying you should try this. Um, do you, do you have any, um, <clears throat> any coach in a few areas? Are there any 
things that you're like, ah, oh, really love that when I get that kind of case or when I get that kind of client, because that's really sort of like up your alley or one of your most fun things to coach on. It's like really strong, hyper-masculine blue collar men. Now it could be a woman because I don't, masculine and femininity are not, I did, right? I do not identify just with like men and women, yeah. but I really like that kind of working with that like hyper-masculine person who's, who's used that like, when I say masculine, what I mean is like, masculine is like A to Z. It's like a straight line. How do we get from here to there? It's like very logic. It's very matter of fact. It's power. It's, um, it is a lot of times like some righteousness or some like true or false, very directness. And it, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, except sometimes there's other stuff available, right? Like spirit and heart and compassion and love and creativity and not knowing how to do so fa like failing is uh, and failing and being okay with failure is I would say not a masculine trait. That's like the, op the hyper masculine does not want that. And I love having these strong, powerful humans in front of me and getting to kind of like, you know, I like said, God like punched me in the nose. I kind of like get to punch them in the nose sometimes, not to tell them they're wrong, but to simply have them like shake their head and look in a new direction and see a new perspective and go, hey, well, you've been trying this and your marriage is shit. So do you want to keep trying this because that doesn't make any sense. Or like- right, That's like a one track, literally a force masculine and you're probably bringing them more into like, uh, let's take a minute and unwrap the discussion with your wife. Let's talk about something. Because again, they're just, it's a very practical go, go, go type of- uh, Totally. Yeah. yeah. And problem solution, problem solution, right. problem solution, right. which is funny because every, we see this in politics, but we don't look at it in our own life. Every problem we solve, we create another problem, right? So we create roads for cars to drive on because- Sorry, my dog didn't like that. Um, we create roads for cars to drive on, but now we need rules and signs. And what happens when we have rules and signs? Well, now how do we enforce them, right? With every new thing, there's another new thing. And so I find that most their most high performers, are you picking that up? Are you hearing my dog bark? Is it's it fine. It's oh, fine. Okay. I mean, unless he's gonna um, go on for the next hour. No, but... no, no, she's, she's let, I'm gonna tell her to be her quiet. Wins. Let her have a couple of barks. She, I have a almost a year old dachshund and she's the sweetest thing in the world, but sometimes oh, yeah. she, uh, um, so I, I love like the, that kind of like shifting that direction for somebody, being able to just say like, Hey, let's just turn your head from like the left to the right. And like, what looks different, right? They don't have to choose to have a new conversation with their wife. They can go do what I'm not making them do anything. And I think the same thing in their companies, it's like, Hey, you're, whatever you did to get your company to 2 million or 500,000 or whatever it's at, likely you're going to have to do something different to take it up to the next level. I know, you know, like we think about like in sports, what got you to be a great high school athlete is not going to make you a great college athlete. You have to, you have to turn it up. You have to change something. Same thing about when you go to the pros, right? You got to turn it up and change something. The difference between a, a professional athlete and a hall of famer same, it's right. They they have to do something different to get to that next level. And I think that it's people really are adverse to that because they're like, but this worked. It's like I got, I, I married her or I built this company to this much money. Why would I want to do something different? You're like, well, because it's, you hit a ceiling. It's not working anymore. It's time to change it up. As goes with the personal life, for sure. Hitting those walls. Yeah. What, um, let's talk a little bit. Let me just, I'm going to throw out some topics to you. Um, you know, throughout this year, a lot of people have lost their jobs. They've had financial strains, you know, because of what's happened in our world. And so for those people out there that are like, ah, I want more money in my life, or I, I want to have a different abundance mindset. What are some of the things you've noticed with people that are holding them back in terms of, you know, phrases they've said about money or opinions and just ways of looking at it. And then, you know, maybe give us some of the turnarounds, uh, that you can think of for those sort of objections. Uh, because I think, you know, obviously you and I both know, you you set your mind to something and you declare a thing like, oh, well, no one's ever gonna pay me that salary or, you know, I mean, you're yeah. never gonna get it. So yeah. I'd love to hear some of the things that have come out of clients' mouths and, and in your experience when it comes to money and maybe even limiting beliefs you once had at one point. Yeah, I think money's a, money's a fun challenge or a fun game 
because it's just paper, right? Or now it's like digital things on a computer screen. I like to think of it as value. I like to think of it as energy. I'm not unique in this, right? There's tons of people talking about this. I, um, I, man, are you picking up that or no? I'm it's like, fine. okay, all right, cool. It's like loud. It's loud, on, it's, loud, all, really it's loud on my side. Let me see if I can, um, sorry about that. It's really loud on my side. This is this, right? We're from home. Everything's from home now. So we're dealing with, I used to have a great podcast studio and I don't because of COVID. Um, so I think that like this year, 2020 into 2021, like woke people up, especially around money, right? It created a lot of fear, a lot of insecurities. Um, my, the first place I like to start is like people's relationship to the conversation. And this was mine too. My familial story with parents who, you know, like and grandparents from the depression times were like the, sh the other shoe is always going to drop. So like, no matter how much money you got and how things were going, you better save it. You better hoard it because like something bad's going to happen. That's a scarcity and limiting yes. mindset. So when I was looking at my money conversations, I had to first go back and deal with like the stories that were in my mind. And that it's kind of fun to go, wait, what, tell me all the things that you think about money. Oh, money doesn't grow on trees. Money's evil. People, money is power, right? Like all these ideas and then get really clear and go, wait, none of this is real. Like these are all made up ideas. And are they, are the made up ideas working for you? Great. If they are, keep them. If they're not working for you, well, how do we deconstruct them? So I did things like I thought money was scarce, like there wasn't enough money for everyone. So I started just practicing like the opposite, just to shake it up. I was like, I'm just going to start looking for abundance in life. And at the time I was living in New York City and I remember like when it really clicked, I walked into a bar one day and was like, man, there's a lot of alcohol in here. Like there's so much alcohol, right? It was just something simple. And then I went into the bathroom and I was like toilet paper stacked to the ceiling. And all these things are just like money pays for all these things, right? And there's all these people in here spending their money. Like well, that. if there's not enough money, how do we, how is the bar stocked? How is there, how are the people paying for it? And it just started to like create little cracks in my belief. I, and, I like this. And I just want to highlight that the, you're not looking for how you can pay or buy something, but you're looking at sort of just the money train of what happens behind things like walking to bar and see bottles behind on a shelf. And just yeah. going, let me think about the monetary uh, aspect of that. That is such a great tip for everybody to, again, look at, because money is everywhere and everywhere. we don't think of it that way. We just think of it as the object and we move on, but it mm -hmm. costs money. So I love that. And look at the car, like, look at when you're driving down the road, how many car, how many Teslas do you see now, depending on where you live? And maybe it's not a Tesla where you it's live. Maybe. Everywhere, right? <laughs> no, exactly. And when you think it's like, those cars are not, that is not a cheap car, right? 140 G's just minimum, right? For some of them. And I think yeah. like you see Range Rovers and you see BMWs and you see Mercedes and all of these things are money. And there's so many more. And when you, I think when you start to turn that like frequency dial and you start to focus, you're like, well, there's a lot more available. And then you start to go, wait a minute, the government just prints more when they want more. So there's something wacky about money. And like, we don't need to go into the finance of like how the impact of that, but like right. the stories we have about money are so silly. Money actually does grow on trees. It's paper. That's where paper comes from, right? Like we have these such silly ideas. So that, that to me is the first thing. And I like to also, that, and when you asked about like with clients, so when the pandemic started and a lot of my clients, I want to say 80% of my practice thrived, 20% left right away out of fear, just ran away and went, you know, into their fear, whatever they do with fear, which was like, you know, cut everything off, like cut off the limb, sew it up and just like deal with it versus trying to actually have it be better. 80% of my practice thrived. They had like, at the end of last year, they were like, it was one of the best years of their lives, financially, relationships, monetary, everything. Um, and I think with those, we started to look at, listen, who do you want to be when something like this happens? So, hey, the wor whole world's being impacted in various ways. Do you want to be the person who like builds a wall around yourself and is all about being safe? Or do you want to be a person who's like out there trying to do something? I like to think of it as like, if you're a quarterback and your offensive line is like, like weak and the defense is coming through, if you start panicking and like 
get jittery, you're only going to make it worse. The quarterback, unfortunately, has to be the one to kind of stay calm, stay poised, and keep their kind of like their groundedness so they can keep trying to do their job and be aggressive. If they are afraid, then they're going to be tucking the ball away or falling down or throwing it away early because of that, which is never going to get them more forward. So I look at like with my clients, hey, do you want to be the skittery, the, the like scared quarterback who's afraid of my, they might get sacked by the economy or the world or other businesses? Or do you want to be the quarterback who's like, okay, I might get sacked, but I'll get up and I'll have another play. So I'm going to like stick to my game plan and I'm going to keep going forward. And I'm going to be the one finding the targets that I said are going to be there. And I'm going to play for those targets, regardless of what's happening around me. I love it. What's, um, what's a good, uh, if, if, if something comes to mind, you know, in coaching, you'll have someone come to you with, with something you go, huh, oh, you know, hadn't, hadn't thought about that. Not that it's something you can't deal with, but just something like unique. Is there uh, an issue or a story of a client that came to you with somewhat of a unique uh, growth issue in some way? And um, what was that? Or, and if not, if there's not one of those examples, I'd love to hear some other examples of maybe some 180s of people with mindset and in working with them and how that, you know, how that worked out. For me, the biggest one is like very, like, I want to say culturally relevant right now, which is um, like a race conversation that somebody came to me and their, their limiting beliefs or their stories had to do with their race. And I think this is really interesting because right. while I still think they are stories, right? Like I can't have this because of the color of my skin or people, whatever. They're also their lived realities. So they're they're both they're, they're they're the same thing at the same time, not one or the other. Right. Um, and I think in certain situations, as a as a as a good leader as a coach, we have to honor people's lived experiences, to be like, hey, you had this experience and that was really real for you, and that had to be hard. And and what did that change? You know, what how did that impact your life? And be able to say, hey, if you if you hold on to this lived experience, like you keep like replaying it and making it more real, you're continuing to, to give your power away. Um, I th and I think a lot of people have trouble with that. It's like, they make it like it has to be one or the other. And I had never experienced that until I worked with somebody who was a, from a very different, I want to say like cultural and racial upbringing than myself. Yeah. So I had to, as a, like, I had to like lean back and like he really hear them to see that like, I couldn't just be like, you know, that's a limiting belief. You, you let's just, that would not, that would have lost me a client and it wouldn't have served, served that person to have them have a really big breakthrough where I want to say they got to do a lot of healing, which is not like my, I don't want to say like, that's not my specialty, but I provided a place where they got to be seen and heard and like have a lot of that bottled up energy out. And then they were able to say, like, I don't want that to be like my story going forward, um, which was a really cool, yeah, you know, tra transformational thing. Um, and I actually changed an aspect of my coaching practice after that, where I now in my, um, when I'm, when I meet somebody and they're we're talking about working together, I ask them about their cultural and familial background yes. because I like want it like, right? We only know what we know. I only know what it's like to be like a white American male, right? I can't know what it's like to be something else. And unless you share with me what it's like to be that. Um, and so now I get to hear, and sometimes people will say, why does it matter that I tell you that I was born in this country or whatever? I'm like, it it's matters. Not, yeah. And it, it doesn't necessarily matter for me, right? It's how it can serve them, um, which I think is really important. It doesn't matter for me personally. It matters for our work together. Um, yeah, that's a that's a great example about the race thing. It reminds me of an example. So one of my favorite uh, all time like po positive, awesome law of attraction guys, Mike <laughs> Dooley. He uh, tells a story, Love and I think, I think in Thoughts Becomes Things, his video, he does a story about a guy who he just kept getting like, it's, he was gay and it seemed like everywhere he went, like there was a slur, you know, the people at work were making fun of him. And it's just like, he lived in this world of again, being attacked and expecting the worst of people in this mm -hmm. way as how he was seen. And um, this kept happening. And then, you know, he was coached through having a different mindset about it. S sort of 
ending the expecting of it, bringing in another vibration. And I, this could have happened with your client too. It's happened with some of mine with certain arenas where when you get a hold of that, you start putting out an energy, the stuff does change. And in that environment, it was like the one guy who was really a jerk quit. You know, he, he noticed that people on the street weren't calling him out and yelling at him. And I have a friend who's beyond this now, but is a person that grew up sort of expecting the worst from everyone and everything. So thinking someone might hurt them physically or thinking like, again, just very on edge and in this fight or flight, like getting ready to be attacked and shot down. Now, of course they had self-esteem and self-worth issues they had to deal with and da, 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 but it's the outlook will confirm the outlook. It keeps confirming your experience. So like you said, it was true for him, legit yeah. true, but that doesn't mean you can't change it because there's plenty of people of that race, of that background that have zero problems that are probably like, I've never been discriminated against ever. Now, rare, but no, probably, you know, there's some out there and same, same with people who let's say grew up maybe in LA and were gay and were in a family that accepted it. And they never really had to deal with any sort of harsh realities of homophobia. So it is interesting, but until you turn around those expectations, right? You're not gonna get a different outcome. I'd love to hear how that person was able to progress or what was it about them or what came out of their mouth was a, that was a different tune, you know, about their, their race and their scenario. Well, they started to like, to your point, like they just started to show up different, which is the, I think the thing that the, to me, that's the magic of actual coaching. It's it's not how much money you can make or do you find your partner. It's that if we change or shift something about the way you see the world, right? If I don't see the world as a dangerous, scary place anymore, how do I show up in the world, right? right? I can show up. If the world's a dangerous, scary place, it's hard to be confident. It's hard to be sure of yourself. It's hard to be like, to, to go get a job or to find a partner or whatever. But if I suddenly see the world as whatever I choose to see the world, right? I, my personally, I'm constantly going, bad things happen, but where's the opportunity? I don't wanna pretend like crappy stuff doesn't happen. It does, it happens all the time. But what's the opportunity in the crappy stuff? Like what, what door did that show us that we didn't see before? And that, outlook has me, even when bad stuff happens, I go, okay, where's the gold nuggets? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. Cause this is real shitty. So this better be a good one. It's going to be yep. good. I don't know when I'm going to see it, but I got you. I got you. That's yep. how I kind of approach it. I play it almost like a game. Like, okay, I see you. It's going to be good. It's better be good. <laughs> totally. And it's, and it's like, I, you know, if I get, I'm just going to use, if I like, if a deal goes bad, if I get dumped, like if something happens that you're like, Ooh, like it just like hits you right in, you know, in your heart, in your head or whatever. I now, and I was not like this go, Ooh, man, the, the, whatever's coming. Oh, I'm super excited. Like it that's is. My, that's my, I feel yeah. like the harder you get hit, the better the return, the better the prize. If, with this outlook though, right? Because, yes, yes. but because it, my outlook used to be, oh, it's another shitty thing, another shitty boss, another shitty girl, like another, and then it was like, I took that into the next one. So I don't like to think of it as like, it's not magic, right? If I go on a bad date and the, let's just say the girl's a big jerk and like, just, you know, whatever, I'm making this up. And then I'm like, oh, dating is the worst. I hate dating. Well, how's that next date going to go with whoever it is? Like, it's just probably not going to go well. But if I show up like, man, dates are fun. I get to meet someone new. I get to experience the life of someone else for a minute, whether we go out again or not. Like the op the odds are I show up like that and that person's going to be like, oh, this person's really cool. They want to know. You're open to me. more possibilities in that mm -hmm. vibration versus the they all suck, whatever. Another one. I hope I get through the first 10 minutes. Like that kind of attitude. Yeah. Um, you're not leaving room open for the collapsibility of a lot of potentials that can be there when you're like, I'm just going to go in, meet someone, learn about their life. I may learn something. I may not. It may be boring. Oh, well, you know, hopefully they had a good time. Like we're just totally being very open about it. You know, it's funny. I was thinking about um, what was the scenario? Gosh, it was just on the tip of my tongue that someone approached me with. I'll remember it in a second, but anyway, continue. Well, you, you, you asked me about too, that client, like that standpoint that like, we, they got to, re, they got to actually release the bottled up energy around like being a victim of their race and our, on our world and our society. And they got to, it was like, it wasn't invalidated. Right. So it was real. It was true for them. They got to get rid of that, all that energy. 
And then, and then they got to start showing up as the person they wanted to see themselves as versus the person they thought the world saw them as. So then I want to say like the things that happened became less personal. So if they didn't get the job, they, they could actually like more be Teflon like and go, well, that sucks. I'm going to go to the next job with this, seeing the same possibility, looking for the opportunities. And they were able to then create the things that they wanted. But the better part is that instead of, it's not just the creating the things, the experience of it was like more the life they wanted. So in the getting of like, in the business world or in the relationship world, they were like, man, this is fun. I'm like having a good time. I like my life. I'm, I view when somebody does something like, let's say racially, whatever to me, that's their shit. Like, and, and it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It doesn't mean it can't hurt my heart and I, I can't be heartbroken for the world, but it doesn't actually have to mean something about me. It really means something more about them. Yeah, which it doesn't have, have to mean anything about my future either. Now I'm dictating, yeah. throwing this whole little scenario into my whole future. I mean. And I think like, as a, I like, I personally would never have known like these experiences, right? I think it's a gift that like we as coaches get to work with people that trust us with their lives. And we're like, oh my God, I never could have imagined what it would have been like to live like this, which then has me flip it around and go, wait, where can I learn from them and do this same thing in my own life? Where do I think my lived experiences are the whole and utter truth? And they're real and I can, you know, let them be real, but I can also like stop having them be my defining stories. Yeah, I was uh, just remembering this you know, how defeating thoughts will create that reality for you after a while. And I remember someone, I was talking to a friend um, a couple of years ago and they had wanted to, they were talking about like writing a book or something. And they were like, I know, but they're like, oh, but like, you know, it's so hard. Like you have, first you have to get an agent and then that agent has to get you a publisher and da, 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 da. And I go, I'm sorry, you're talking to someone that proves that point wrong. Mm -hmm. my experience was not that I went directly to a publisher. It took no amount of time. <laughs> what the fuck? Like you're complaining about something that legit is not true in my yeah. experience. Like sure. you happen yeah. to bring up something. And so anyway, and I bring that up because when there's a defeating thought and we know what that is, cause it's usually like, Oh, that'll never happen because, or I can't because then back in the day, I started to turn it around and I'd go, hold on a minute. No. How about it's going to be easy. And it was, and I found a doctor mm -hmm. in a week on my book who I couldn't find in 15 years of pursuing my thyroid stuff. Or, you know, um, oh, I love guest houses, but they're always taken up and everyone gets them. Blah, 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 blah. No, hold on a minute. Wait, mm, it's my turn. No, how about that's different this year? What if it isn't taken when I call? What if I am the one that gets it? And again, making an alternative to that, it takes some practice. Now my mind naturally bends towards that direction when I when I feel yeah. one of these thoughts come in and they rarely come in. But if they do, I go, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a minute, has this, has other people had a different experience with this, you know? And so again, I just think um, we, we, yeah, we, we, it's great to have an unbiased person in your corner who can help you turn around the things you don't even realize you might need to turn around or look at differently. And again, proposing, you know, half the time when I'm coaching, a, if I'm not like life coaching someone and I'm coaching on just thyroid health and things like that, oftentimes there are lots of scenarios that are not right or wrong. It's like, here's this choice. Here's this choice. Here's this choice. There's no right or wrong. There's, you know what I mean? I'm just giving you a bunch of options for what's possible and you can feel what's right for you there. And that's, I think is the goal. Um, what are some other, what are some things in your life that you had to, through the process of becoming a coach, coach your stuff on? You know, I talked to you on your podcast about the shame I had over my physical disability and how that really was like the last piece to my confident as F because I was, it was under the rug there causing problems. Um, was there anything like that for you that you were like, okay, I need to come to Jesus with myself on this? Yeah. Well, I would go back like you, and you shared with me that what, you know, your the, the, um, the, the issues that and challenges that you've had, I had like some pretty intense learning disabilities when I was a kid that, and I'll tell you some good stories around it. So first off, when I was six, my eyes couldn't, like, if you looked at me, I was fine. It wasn't like when I was, you know, floating around somewhere. 
but my eyes actually, the muscles didn't work. So when you read the muscles in your eyes track the words, right? And they move and they go in and they go out, whatever. They didn't work. So when I was a little kid, the teachers thought I was dumb because I had a lot of trouble reading. And my mom was like, man, I, I talk to this kid all the time. He's not dumb. So something, she, she, luckily I had a mom that was aware and paying attention and cared enough to figure it out. And it was like, oh, he has this eye problem. Well, now at six, we went to the eye doctor. We got these little prisms. We had to do these exercises every day. This is a, at the end of six weeks or six, I don't know what it was, six weeks, six months, whatever. We go back to the doctor and the doctor goes, I've never seen this before. And my mom goes, what? And he goes, he is a hundred percent like fixed. And I remember in my mind, well, that's the gift, right? Like my mom made me do these exercises with her every day as a six-year-old, right? Like how awesome is that, that I had this mom? I love but her. You know, what that, you know what that did to me? I thought I was broken. I literally got this like story. Right, something's wrong my, with me. I'm yeah, dumb. And, yep, yeah. and I, now I'm fixed. And then in like probably eight, nine, 10, I found out I had these like other learning disabilities, which it's like as a grown up, I've come to understand learning disabilities simply mean your brain works different. And sometimes we, better. <laughs> sometimes better, totally. Like yeah. our, our system created a standard. No one ever fits into a standard. That's not a thing. We're all so different. Right. But our system created a circle, like our box and said, hey, everyone that's normal fits in here. And if you don't fit in here, there's something wrong with you. Well, as a kid, again, that made me have all these things that I was dumb and school became like really, and so my viewpoint of school was it's hard. I'll never get good grades. If I could just get like B's, my parents will leave me alone. Um, and I can't talk about this because I want to be cool and popular and I don't want people to like, so it was this dual sided and in like, I had a teacher in high school that told my mom, Alex will never go to college because he can't like the way he writes, he can't write. And I, um, I got a knuckle sandwich for that teacher. <laughs> yeah, and I used to say that when I turned in papers, it looked like the teacher slit their wrists and just bled all over them, right? The red ink covered, there was more red ink than black ink. And I wrote a fucking book. Dude, I wrote almost right. a 300 page book, the audio book, there's an audio book, there's workbooks. Like I did, and like, yes, I had an editor. Everyone has an editor, right? Like what, but what, how, like it took me so long to repair that story that I'm dumb, that I'm not smart, that I can't, I don't think I even read a book until I was like 32 years old because of these stories. Sure. Um, and I probably read over 200 books in the last like five years. But I like that to me, that's changed everything. Like I made a decision that like, I'm not dumb. I can read, I can write. And then I did these things. Like we, we couldn't figure out who that teacher was, but I was like, oh, I should mail her a copy of my book and be like, just write on the inside. Fuck you. I love you. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. But uh, that, that, I mean, it's an old, it's like, it's an old kind of ongoing thing, but me writing my book, it was so hard at first to have people read it and give me feedback because anytime somebody read anything, it took me right back to those old memories of like, I'm dumb. Where's I'm not that? smart. Who the fuck am I to write a book? Who would ever want to read a book that I wrote? And the cool thing was like being in that uncomfortable place bro broke it up, right? It made like... I highly encourage people fall in love with being uncomfortable, like fall in love with discomfort, not the bad kind, like the sexually harassing or being abused kind, yeah, but don't the, like, that kind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the like, Hey, when you want to lose weight, it's uncomfortable. It's hard not to eat the things you want to eat. It's hard to work out hard all the time. If you want to write a book, it's going to be uncomfortable to sit in front of the computer and get feedback and have people tell you these things don't make sense, or this needs to be rewritten. But at the end of the day, the things that we want are always on the other side of discomfort and you get to decide how you want to relate to it. Like I kept, I had to change when I would get feedback and go, they're not criticizing me. They're helping me. They're actually taking time out of their life, the readers to help me make my book better. Yeah. And, and then I had to practice saying that every single time I got feedback until there was like, I want to, it's like, it's brain science, right? There were new synapses connecting. Yeah. And the old synapses stopped connecting. Um, and now- and That's so interesting because, you know, as far as you know me, you can tell I'm a, I'm a no BS person. I'll just tell you mm -hmm. straight up. If you were like, hey, Elle, I want your honest opinion on something, I would probably go, I'm happy to give you my opinion, but I'm probably going to give you my 
brutally honest opinion. Are you okay with that? And if not, don't ask me for it. Yeah. So um, I did this to someone who wanted me to look at their like sitcom or their screenplay or whatever, a friend of mine. And I said, sure. But, and I told them, I go, are you ready for like real advice? Because, you know, I don't want you to take offense to it, but I'm going to be real with you. Yeah. So if you don't want that, don't ask me. No, no, no. I want that. Yeah. Well, you know, they didn't really, because and I was giving them very constructive feedback um, and they just didn't want to hear it. And they were very resistant and then kind of blamed me for it kind of thing. And, you know, that's the thing too. If you're one of these people, that's a victim mentality. It's also sort of a combative one. It's not really doesn't make a good friend either, that type of vibe. Um, no one likes criticism, but like you said, these people are here to help you, you know, and, and most of the time, I think my advice has made something better for somebody. It's always been advantageous, except for that person who didn't want to take it because they didn't. And what it was is it wasn't even my personal opinion. It was opinion about how long a sitcom should be, like some standard things that they could have just sure. looked up that had nothing to do with my personal opinion. They still didn't want to accept it. They were, they were like angry about it, you know? And so in approaching that, when you're looking, you know, you're going in the world of coaching or you're looking for feedback, um, there's people that are just contrarians. They're defensive constantly. If you're one of these people, you know, you are, because people told you, you've got to loosen up, man. You've got to loosen up. You're never <laughs> going to be able to get in there and change anything about your life. And the contrarians are like the worst because it could be like, oh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, what a beautiful blue sky. Like, periwinkle and you're like oh my god really are we arguing so you know a lot of people have this sort of defense mechanism <laughs> and fight or flight and they're always ready to defend and uh that doesn't make for great growth does it yeah i like to think like i i for me and i and i share this with clients like if you're noticing something come up in your life repeatedly right if you have one friend who's like negative whatever but if if you like notice things show up in your life repeatedly like it's a mirror and so if i notice that i'm having people like very righteous people in my life, right? They're like, this is the right way and this is how things should be and these are the facts and whatever. I have to pause and go, man, what is life mirroring at me? Where am I being righteous? Where am I being the negative yes. person? Where am I being judgmental? Because I think like whatever you see in the world, you see it because it's you, right? Positive people, if you're like truly positive, you're not around negative people. So you're not noticing that. But if you think you're positive, but you're noticing negative people all around you, you're probably being negative somewhere that you're not realizing. And I, I, I think that's- The shadow effect. I think uh, mm -hmm. Debbie Ford, who's now dead now, yep. but she wrote a great book called The Shadow Effect about this. And she brings yeah. up the point, which is a pretty strong one. And it seems harsh, but I get it, which was, you know, like we might look at someone like a rapist and go, oh my God, I, 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 don't, I can't identify with that. I, that's a, like a totally yeah. horrible monster. And she would say, well, what would be the platform of someone who might act this way? Someone who feels yeah. unworthy, unloved, who's been abused, who's had trauma. Have you not experienced any modicum of that? And if so, there's something in there. Um, again, that's not to say we're going to compare ourselves on the same level, but that's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I had a friend many years ago who, uh, I'm just, I'm just going to say, I'm in California, it's legal now, but uh, she was very moochy with the household with her marijuana. She was always like, she never bought marijuana. She was always bumming from people <laughs> and stuff. And so the roommates were like, so they're like hiding it from her because they're like, just she's at some point like, and I was like, why don't you just ask her? Like, just tell her, but they, they couldn't because they couldn't speak up. So anyway, but I noticed that she started to complain often about another friend and it bothered her so much because he was mooch and it bothered her. Oh, and she would bring it up every time. And I, I didn't at the time. I would now knowing what I know, but I wanted to be like, because that's you, girl, that's you. You're the mooch. You just don't know it. That's why it's bothering you so much. It's bothering you so much and it's in your space and it's because it's eating away at you because you are that. And so there is an element there, not everything we experience, but there's always something to be said for taking a look. Um, and I agree with you too. I think you've been through the times like this. Sometimes we get on a downward spiral. We're in a negative pattern. Some negative stuff starts to show up. We're having yucky little things with friends or people. And you stop and go, I'm doing this. I'm, do I'm doing this. Where do I need to cut myself off? Where do I need to start over? Um, I know that nothing I see in front of me is just random. Yeah, I've, I mean, my journey and my process is unfortunately like, I don't have a lot of connect, like close friends and connections from my old life in the restaurant world because it didn't serve me. And I don't want to say like people are there to serve you, but like 
it didn't serve me to spend time and be around people that were like not headed in the direction I wanted to go in. Yeah. And, and this is the thing I would, I love them. I have no ill will about mm-hmm. anything or anything bad. I just am like, Hey, I'm, it's kind of like, Hey, if all your friends, all they want to do is eat nachos and pizza, but nachos and pizza makes you feel crappy. So when you hang out with them, if that's what's there, that doesn't serve you. Like if, if you feel good eating just vegetables what, or, or meat or whatever, like if they want to come with you too, great. Like, come on, come with me to do this thing. But I can't go do that thing with you that isn't serving me anymore. Um, I think that was, that's sometimes the, one of the hardest parts about really trying to change your life is yep. like blessing and releasing. You know, I don't, I don't not, I, I, if, anybody I've had a few people from my past show up and like, Hey, I want to talk to you about coaching or how have you changed your life? It's like the dream come true because you loved these people and you want the best for them. But sometimes like we do have to separate ourselves from things. I think it's the same in relationships. You know, the, the best relationship I've ever had in terms of the person I love the most, like I had to walk away from because it actually wasn't the healthiest. And I really believe like, the people that we'll both find will actually be better. Like I had to believe in that. And this kind of takes us back to how we see the world. I created a mantra a few years ago for myself that was everything always works out for me. And the coolest part about this is the people around me make fun of me for it now and accept it as truth. So like- I love it. At one point, I forget what happened. Something happened to me like a few months ago. I don't even remember what it was, but it was like kind of shitty. And I was like a little heartbroken and sad. And my cousin goes, dude, whatever. You fuck, fucking life. You are going to like get a, like a genie is going to show up with a bag of gold. And I started laughing and she was like, you know, what's hilarious about this. She goes, a friend of hers who I only know a little bit when the situation actually, whatever happened in the situation, it, it did go really well. Her friend who I barely know goes, why does this always happen to Alex? Like, why does he, like, he gets himself into these situations, shit goes wrong. And then the it's like better on the other side. And she's like, that's yeah. who he is. Like he, he's creating it like that. And then- I, I love this so much because I wasn't one of these people until mm-hmm. I became one. And then again, you get, you, you call someone, you go, oh my God, you won't believe this incredible manifestation. I'm walking on a hike. I mean, the next thing you know, I'm speaking to Academy Award winning. <laughs> and they're like, and, and the response is always, of course, of course that happened to you. Like mm-hmm. I have become synonymous with lucky or some yeah. people might use that word. Um, and it's great. It's great because it has shown to be true for other people for both of us at this point moving i mean yeah. i guess saying we, we probably definitely should be coaches um but yeah no that's fun i love that and i love that reminding yourself of that there might be moments you have to actually remind yourself of that too and at least oh it's God. there for you yeah no i and i i actually think it's the hardest when it's like real heartbreak you know when you like actually and i don't like heartbreak in love heartbreak with like dreams i think when we get like a really good shot to the heart and we feel like really just like broken and saddened by whatever that thing is. I, you're like, there was a moment not that long ago where I had a day where I just like sat on the floor in my room and I was just in tears and I didn't even know where they were coming from. And I would let the energy out. But then I would also say like, I kept having to like remind myself, like whatever's next is going to be so good. And like, I'm so, I can't wait for it. Doesn't mean I can't be sad in the moment, right? I don't want to miss this moment of my life, but this like reassuring Versus the alternate, remember the old story that I used to tell is like, oh, here we fucking go. Here's one bad thing. That's my luck. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, I'm not a, I'm not a believer in like, like, like quote unquote luck, but it's like we, whatever you look for, you will find. So when, when bad shit happened in 2020 to so many people, I'm like, how do we pivot? What's the opportunity? What can we do now? Doesn't mean the things didn't happen. But it's like, I'm choosing to look for an opportunity or a possibility while other people are choosing to look for how they're going to get hurt, how they're going to be impacted. And like, that's just your choice, right? Like that's an, that, and, and I, I also, I like to say this, we're having a conversation that people are probably watching on YouTube or are listening to on their iPhones or whatever they're doing. They're, they likely have all their basic needs met. If you're listening to this show, you probably That's have right. food. You, you have food, shelter, likely. Yeah. 
I'm not, you know, if you don't have food, air, safety, shelter, water, this, I like to say like, Hey, this doesn't apply to you. We need to get you yeah, your basic we need needs. The practical stuff first. Let's get you in a homeless totally. shelter that then moves you to, yeah, we got to yeah. like ground zero takes a different route. Yeah. 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 This is like, uh, people that, you know, if you got an iPhone that you're paying for on a payment plan that you can pay every month and do all these things, you also have the opportunity to change the way you view the world, change the way you see things, change the way you show up. Um, and if you, and it's just a choice it might not be, it might not feel like an easy choice, but it's a choice. Yeah. It's really, it's really worth going down this path of self-improvement, working with a coach, someone who's unbiased, uh, someone who, and this is why, and as you know, this is why we as coaches also go to coaches because mm -hmm. even though our friends are coaches, I'm not going to call my friend who's a coach. I mean, maybe yeah. on a little small thing where I'm, ah, I need to get turned around here real quick, help me out. Okay. But if I really want to do a session on something, I am not going to go to one of my friends who's a coach. I'm going to go pay a coach, yeah. you know what I mean? Who's yeah. not also like a really good friend of mine um, because we see the value of how important it is to be unbiased in every arena. And that really comes from, from coaching. Um, you know, I've, I've had such great conversations with you so far. I look forward to, to more in the future. Um, I also, on the last topic we were talking about, the people that say those things like, oh, it's all right. It always works out like that kind of stuff. I see that it's always true. And the ones that are like, just my luck. I got screwed again. They're always getting always, screwed. Yeah. Like it always kind of follows, you know, um, let's talk about functional authenticity. Sorry, fictional. Fictional. Yeah. Yeah. That's your next one. Functional. Um, <laughs> first of all, like where, you know, we'll put all of the things to connect with you in the show notes, but where can we get the book? Where can we benefit more from you and your work and get coaching from you? If that's something we want. So I'm super excited. The audio book came out on Friday, this past Friday. I don't know when this will, we all air this, but so like, it will already be out by the time this uh, airs. Yeah. So yeah. So, so it just came out. So you can get the audio book. I know people like audio books more than, than real reading. Um, it's on uh, fictional authenticity. It's on iTunes. It's on audible. It's on, um, uh, Amazon. If you want to give away some copies, I'm happy to give you some promo codes that people can download the audio books for free. Um, well, you know what, maybe we'll do a giveaway on Instagram or something like that with your book. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, maybe yeah. Away, that'd be awesome. Yeah. And then you can buy the actual book if you want to read, um, on Amazon, like, you know, like where everyone gets their books. Um, and then if you go, if people want to connect with me or talk to me about coaching or programs, or just, I don't know, I make a lot of videos walking my dog on the beach, talking about life. Uh, I'm inspirational Alex on Instagram. Um, and everything about my business is at the dreammason.com. The dreammason.com. Great. Yeah. And same name of your podcast, which definitely check it out. I think everyone listening and watching Alex can see that he's, he's great, has a lot of great content. Um, so, so awesome to meet you. Thank you for coming on our show. Is there anything you'd like to leave our audience with as we depart here? Mm. Um, oh, what feels like really good to me. I think the thing right now is um, I'm on a kick right now of like life should feel good. And again, like this, I, we're talking to a, a specific group of people, but like, if your life doesn't feel good, like you're not enjoying it, you're not having passion. And, and when I say passion, it's not just like in the, like passion and pleasure in the sexual realm, but in all realms, if you're not feeling good about like the way you're eating, the, your relationships, your career, your business, yourself, and like, it's actually pleasurable, go the other way, turn around, stop, pivot, do something different. Cause like life is meant to be, if we're not enjoying this life, like what the fuck is the point? And, and when I say that, I, I like to like think that pleasure isn't eating a piece of pizza and then feeling bad about it later. Pleasure isn't, pizza's come up a lot on this episode. Pleasure isn't like going out and sleeping with someone you're going to regret sleeping with later. Cause it might feel good in the moment. Pleasure. That's like, that's false pleasure. Pleasure is eating a meal that's delicious and feeling great later because that's what you're committed to. Pleasure is opening yourself up to someone, um, making each other feel good, and then feeling good about the decision later, like whether it lasts or it doesn't last, but that you're actually happy that you made these choices. I think that we were so, cons we, we do this great thing or unfortunate thing where we're like so caught up in like feeling good in the moment, but then not on the long term. And then we mistake that for pleasure, that a real life filled with pleasure is a, is a pleasure that's extended. The choices we make now feel pleasurable, but the, the consequences of them are also pleasurable. I love that. I love so. that. Thank you so much, Alex Terranova. We will put everything to connect with him in the show notes and everyone else, we will see you next week. Thanks for having me.